curse tonight. Uh, we're glad you still came. <laughs> Whew. Wow. Well, uh, we're streaming again tonight. So hello, everybody out in the internet, everywhere, around the world, wherever you are. We're thrilled to have you joining us here at the Super Sears Conference. This is our last session, and uh, we are going to have a lot of fun. This, what I'm going to do tonight is probably one of uh, my wife's favorite sessions. It's, it's one of uh, the ones I don't do everywhere. It's one that I'm selective about. It's one that I, I really make sure I'm, I'm feeling comfortable from the Lord that this is a good place to do it. So I think, I think uh, this is my fifth time here, and I haven't done this here yet, which is crazy, because this is definitely a house I could have earlier, but we have, uh, we have waited, and the SEER conference, the Super SEER conference is a whole nother, uh, you know, realm of what we're doing. This is, this has really been a lot of fun, and has been really unique, and um, having Louise here and having Gary Oates here, it's just been tremendous. And so, since you guys are here, it'll probably go a little different, and we haven't talked about this beforehand, so you have no idea what I'm going to do, and it shouldn't make you that nervous, it's okay. So, <laughs> um, but I'm going to throw this out here a little bit early for you guys, that uh, be looking around the room in the spirit while I'm talking, and um, get get some some input on what's going on in the room and what is in the room as as I share because um, when the time comes we're going to do some activation and release some stuff and uh, it'll be great to have your confirmation because normally I'm giving other people confirmation but it's kind of cool to have a team here so this is really a unique opportunity that we have tonight so let's see We've talked a lot about the imagination, and I'm just going to lay a little bit of foundation, a little bit of, of uh, baseline, and then from there, we have a lot of time that we're going to dedicate to uh, activation in a little while, and we will have uh, some more worship in a little bit as well. Hopefully the worship team knows that. I don't see one of them in the room, but uh, we can, oh, thank you, Hannah. Yeah, she's here. So... She will inform the rest. But, uh, yeah, this is such a good foundation that we have to get. And as, as Americans, as Westerners, Western-thinking people, we have had such a trouble with the imagination. And it's this thing that, that uh, really, the imagination is neither good nor bad. It's neutral. If... Uh, to use another illustration of how the imagination works, the imagination is a screen. It's the, it's, I call the uh, imagination like an organ of your spirit, and it's a screen that God projects images onto. And in the same way that he projects images, the devil also wants to project images onto. That's why there's so much in scripture that talks about watching over the meditation of your heart. Because the meditation is really like the projector that projects images onto the screen of your imagination. So what you spend time, what, what discs you put into the mind that you meditate on, project images onto your imagination. So if you're meditating on the wrong things, you'll be imagining the wrong things. And as you imagine the wrong things, a lot of us point the finger at the imagination when really we have to point the finger at the meditation. And so the imagination has gotten a bad rap, and most of it's the choice of what you focused on with your meditation. And there's people who say, well, I just don't know if I can imagine things real well. I, I don't, I'm not very imaginative. I don't have uh, a good imagination. Well, have you ever worried about your finances? You have a great imagination. 
Anytime we get into anxiety, worry, fear, all of that stuff, those are things we choose to meditate on. And when you choose to meditate on it, you start to form a picture in your imagination, which is, I have no house, I have no car, I have no job, I have no clothes, I have no shoes, I live in a box downtown, I live in a van down by the river. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> you like that? Thank you. Uh, hashtag SNL. So we... <laughs> <laughs> so we we got to really keep an eye on this thing because so often we're we're blaming the imagination like I need to be delivered of my imagination. It's not the one at fault here. It's the meditation and it's the choice of what we meditated on. And we got to go back to okay, what did I choose to fill my imagination with? That's where this whole thing started. Back here with the meditation, then the imagination. That being said, you spend a whole weekend focused on seeing in the spirit. So you're meditating on it. So your imagination's getting a bunch of stuff because we're activating it. We're practicing it. And then we could leave town and you could stop meditating on it. And stop activating and stop practicing. And go, well, I guess... It just happens when they're in town. That's what happens with a lot of conferences. They go, you know, oh, just the healings just happen when that person's in town. The prophecy flows under that person's umbrella. There's some truth to that. But the majority of the time, it's that we stop doing the, the focus, the meditation, the, the filling the mind and the heart with those things. That word meditation, actually the Hebrew word for it, means to chew, like to chew the cud. It's that cow taking it down, bringing it up, stomach after stomach. That's meditation. In, in the false religions of the world, meditation is emptying yourself so that some entity will come and fill you. And when it comes and fills you, now you have a supernatural encounter. It's totally different than biblical Christian meditation, which is you fill yourself with certain things, not that you empty yourself of certain things. You fill yourself with the word. You fill yourself with focusing on the presence. And as you do that, that causes you to then enter in. And we've been talking about that this encounter, this experience, and focusing on the Lord, and people have been having activation. It's been happening already this weekend. I mean, people I know that I know already have very strong relationship with the Lord, are already walking in a lot of stuff, have gone to a whole nother level this weekend. So, so this is going to help it keep going, is that intentionality to make those choices, to, to see this ahead of time, so that uh, it's not lost when we leave. It's not a come and go kind of impartation. But it's something that can remain, that can be here. And a lot of that is turning our focus and keeping, keeping our focus properly. The other thing about the imagination that's really a challenge for us, not only is it neutral, it's neither good nor evil, but also it's real. Uh, Gary touched on this a little bit in passing, but in Matthew 5 where Jesus is talking about adultery and he's talking about murder. He says, you know, you've, you've heard the commandments, do not kill and, and do not commit adultery. And then he talks about that if you harbor hate in your heart, it's as if you've committed murder. That if you harbor lust in your heart, it's as if you've committed the act of adultery. Those two pictures, for us, we, we may not get the full impact. We may just see it and say, well, he's talking about a heart issue. Well, that's true. But something more than that. Let's say, for example, that this podium were to separate the natural and the spiritual realms. Over here we have the natural realm. Over here we have the spiritual realm. Over here in the natural realm, what he's saying is, if you commit adultery in the natural realm, you've committed adultery. If you kill someone in the natural realm, you've committed murder. That's what they all understood. But he's saying, if you come over here in the realm of the imagination, also known as the spirit realm... If you come over here in this realm and you kill people or you commit adultery, it's as real as if you did it over here. That makes a huge statement because Jesus is saying this realm 
is just as real as this realm. Just because you can't see it doesn't make it any less real. In fact, that realm's a lot less real. Because this one was pre-existent and will continue to exist far long after that one is done. This is the temporary realm. And this temporary realm that we live in temporarily is not the superior reality. This one over here is. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand something, saying, guys, it's real. If you come over here, you, you sin, you actually bring back with you a real stain of sin that you have to do something about. You can't just leave it over there. It actually stains you when you come back. And you're going to have to repent of something. So part of the issue, see, everything, everything in this realm, the natural realm, once existed only in this realm. At some time in, in the past, God had an imaginative thought named Gary Oates. Had an imaginative thought named Marcia Clemens. Or whatever your maiden name was. I, I'm assuming you guys got married after you were born. But um, <laughs> I know it was early that you started dating. But you have this, this thing back here where God is in this realm, the spirit realm. And he has an idea. And then it's brought into the natural world. Everything starts over there. Everything in this realm started over here. Let me give you another example the chair that you're sitting on once only existed in the realm of the imagination. Somebody had to come over here in their imagination, design and grab a hold of that chair. Then they brought that chair into reality, which is really just bringing it into our realm. So everything that exists here once only existed over here. Somebody actually came over and got it. The chair you're sitting on, the room, the shape, the, the slant, the lights, everything started over here and somebody came over and grabbed it and brought it back. We call them inventors, but this happens all the time. Every time you have a creative thought, every time you do something that hasn't been done before, you do it a way that you've never done it before, you're getting an idea here and you're pulling it into your reality. See, that's... It's one of the things that's absolutely changing in our generation, especially the last 30, 40 years is that people are grabbing a hold of things that have never been seen on the planet before. Now, I know that this has been happening for all of human history. It sped up a lot a hundred years ago, but it's going so fast now that it's like breakneck speed. It's so overwhelming what is happening all the time. And now we have, uh, I remember Dan McCollum, we were doing a conference together, and he said that they, they've tracked, they said that the rate of, of information doubling is every two weeks. I don't even know what that fully means, but he's saying the, the rate of, of knowledge and information that exists is doubling every two weeks. There's no way to wrap your mind around some of these statements. But with things moving that fast, there's so much coming over into our realm that this is changing all the time. It really should be impossible to be an atheist at this point. I mean, it's just so obvious that there's something that put this together, and brilliantly so. And the, the fact that <clears throat> there has to be a realm. I mean, the fact that quantum physicists are talking about string theories and other dimensions and God particles, and they, they just don't even know what to do with all this stuff. It's so obvious that there's something more at work here. And as those who are in relationship with the one who not only created that realm, but also created this realm and lives within this realm. See, there was an imagination inside you before the fall in the garden. He creates Adam and Eve in his image, in his likeness. As a creator with an imagination, 
They're already created as creative beings with an imagination. Then he assigns them saying, you need to name all the animals. Well, how? However you want. There's this freedom that's involved in the whole thing. There's this level of freedom where he's saying, just, just name them. Go for it, Adam. And as he's naming them, I, I believe it was actually giving them a nature. You know, that's a lion. That's a monkey. Ha ha ha. That's a giraffe. That's an elephant. He's giving them names that also are affecting the animal's personality or character. Now, some theologians actually believe that the animals could talk before the fall. So when Balaam's donkey talked, it was not so much of a one-time occurrence as much as a stepping back to something that used to go on more normally. I can't prove that to you. I'm just saying that it's, it's a theory that a lot actually ascribe to. So we have, we have so much more available to us. And I just wonder if we were to take on more intentionality in our lives. Just, just let this be a general thought. Just let this sink in. An intentionality that says, I'm not just going to live inside this realm. But I'm going to go over here, into my imagination, into this realm in the spirit, and grab a hold of things. And drag them back over here. Uh, this, for me, this has been huge because I have watched traditional ministry for years. I've grown up in church. A lot of us have, right? I mean, probably a good number of us have grown up in church. And we've seen what church is like. But what's possible? I mean, does church just have to be what church has always looked like in this box? Is, is getting a, a Bible education, does it always require going to a four-year Bible school, learning Greek and Hebrew, and memorizing certain things? I don't think so. And I think especially for our generation where things are at, there's so much more possibility here to grab a hold of things and pull them over into this world. Uh, personally, as an itinerant minister, I, I've seen... For years, and I, Gary's watched it too, we have so many people we've watched and friends and colleagues that they've done itinerant ministry a certain way. And they do it that way year after year after year. And it's a real challenge for their families. It's a challenge for their ministry, for their staff, for their children and grandchildren. And I, I just wonder if there's things over here, creative wisdom that can be gotten a hold of that changes how we do life. So, so many of us are stuck in this little... It's a poverty-minded thing, but it's stuck inside this box that when someone's born, you have from zero to five. They're zero to five, they're learning how to walk and talk and grow some teeth and move from milk to some applesauce to... You know, you got this basic process, zero to five. When they get to five, you put them in school. And they're in school for the next 15 or however many years. So you have through high school graduation, another four years of college, maybe five years of college, if they go for master's or they aren't very good. And you have five years of college. That's a joke. And then... <laughs> Um, but you have this, this process that they're going through, and then they finish that. And now that I actually just read a report recently that was saying that, that kids are waiting now till their late 20s to get married because they're living under such crippling college debt that they just don't even feel confident getting married. So they're putting that off. So you wait with that. You try to pay off some debt. You get further down the road. Then you finally get married. You spend however many years... Uh, trying to afford enough to buy a house, you buy a house, you live under the weight of that house for however long, you have some kids, you try to raise them right, you put them in school, they go do their school thing for however long, then they finally graduate, and you're at this age where you're saying, okay, now I can hopefully, maybe, possibly, oh my goodness, I hope, retire, and maybe do something before I run out of years. <sighs> It's hard to advance the kingdom inside of that structure of thinking. Because that's not the freedom that we were given in the garden. But it's very American. 
It's not kingdom, and I'm not saying it's anti-kingdom. It's just the structure of our society. And a lot of us have swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. And I don't ever talk about this in this message. I'm just sharing, you know, a perspective that I, I am not willing to live within, within that structure anymore. It's not okay with me. And I, I'm, hopefully, we'll see other people get more and more uncomfortable to say, we need to be more creative. Because this is killing us. This is not going to work. And it's not going to give us the freedom we need to do all that he's called us to do. Hmm. <laughs> uh, there's a book that was written a few years ago. It was a New York Times bestseller. It's called um, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. The World is Flat. And the concept is that everything has changed. Now if an American graduates college and someone in India graduates college, they can both be fighting for the exact same jobs. The world has been flattened because of technology. And we're at a point now where because of that shift, we have to get outside of any restrictions. See, Jesus talked about his followers will be like the wind. That you don't know where they're coming from, you don't know where they're going. They have that level of freedom. They can move and things flow. And that does not mean, when I say flow, I don't mean flake. Those are two different things. You know, I don't want to be like the wind, so I pick up my ministry and move all over the place every two years because I felt led. No, that's, that's nonsense. That's not what I'm talking about. Have some character as well. But there's, there's a level of freedom that is available to us that we haven't stepped into. And on, on the whole, I'm not saying every individual, but for the majority of us, there's a lot more freedom that's possible. And there's a lot of people looking just simply for jobs rather than looking for provision. And a job is what everybody gets. But maybe there's provision. Maybe there's some other way that the Lord's going to give you something. And you're going to have to be entrepreneurial. You're going to have to be very hardworking. And you're going to have to get on it to make it work for you. But it could provide the freedom that you wouldn't have just getting a job. And when you get a job, you're working for someone else who has that freedom and was hardworking and entrepreneurial. So now they don't live under a job. And that's what we're called to be. So, so this whole concept is that this realm is real. And I don't want us to have this dualistic thing where we separate out the spirit realm from the natural realm. And we as believers, we do this so much. We do it all the time. And we say, you know, there's church and then there's normal life. There's the, the, there's the movies that I like to watch, and then there's the movies I'll tell my friends that I actually saw. And we separate out things in our life to such a degree that we have our kind of churchy Christian life, and we have, you know, our other life. And we do it with, we do it with work and spirituality. We do it with our, our health, and our body is the temple. Woo, praise the Luya. And then we're back over here, you know? And this, this stuff happens, and it's, it's, not, it's not needed. If anything, I just want us to be more free. I want us to be more free. And as, as more free, we're going to operate in this imagination realm. And don't walk away from this with this thinking that you have to activate your spiritual senses every day to the point that it becomes another discipline that you're forcing. It should be something that becomes just a normal part of your life that's a part of how you flow. It's what Louise is talking about the other morning, or yeah, the other morning when she said that each morning she would wake up, that she had seasons where she'd wake up and she'd just take a few minutes in the presence of the Lord in that secret place that we all experienced the other night, that in that secret place she would just spend a few minutes. 
I just loved hearing that because she was saying, um, she was saying, what if we made that a regular thing? But it should be incorporated just as a part of who you are. Not like, here's my quiet time. Now here's my noisy time for the rest of my life. Here's my devoted time to the Lord. Here's my completely undevoted time. Like, I'm not, I'm not, these, this is my married time of the day, and this is my single time the rest of the day. And yet that's what we do, isn't it? I mean, that's not that far of an exaggeration. This is my married time, that's my single time. And that's not what we want in the spirit realm. We want to flow, we want to stay in it, we want to come in and out and be connected all the time. It's a heart-to-heart -heart relationship where we stay connected. So I want you to see in the spirit. I want us to grow. I want us to move in power. I want us to have a close, intimate relationship with him all the time. I believe if we're more fully integrated, our natural and our spiritual side move together. We walk in a mindset that's free and we're not trapped inside of this is how we've always done it and so this is how we have to do it. If we walk in this creativity, we bring in the imagination realm, you're going to do all of that naturally. You're going to activate. You're going to move in power. It's not just something that you kind of picked up somewhere. It's just a part of how you flow. Oh, you're a sick person? Let's do something about it. It's just a part of who I am. And, and I, I love this about both Gary and Louise as well, is that they're both very normal people. And that's, that's hard for some because there's some places you go where they, they only want you to be the rock star seer. Just come in and be weird and eccentric and prophetic to a degree that you know, you'll never stop in the hallway and talk to people. I'm not okay with that. I'm not going to live like that. Amen. And it doesn't set a real good example. It's not at all like what Jesus was like. So we have to get normal as well as supernatural blended together to the point that there's no difference. You picking up what I'm putting down, Alabama? <laughs> and everyone everywhere, yes. See, so much of this has really started even from our childhood where we've ignored and we've pushed aside the imagination realm and just disregarded it as not even existing. And a lot of it isn't even just from your own pushing it aside, but even from the culture. See, in the West, whether it's Europe or whether it's North America, we have what's called Western rationalistic philosophy. Western rationalistic philosophy says, if I can't taste it, touch it, see it, smell it, or hear it with my five physical senses, it doesn't exist. And Western rationalistic philosophy is a great foundation for atheism, but it is not a good foundation for biblical thought. Biblical thought is that, that I can interact with it in all parts of who I am, spirit, soul, and body. Whereas in atheistic thought or in Western rationalistic philosophy, I have to be able to interact with my five natural senses only. I have to be able to test and observe. Test and observe. This is uh, the foundation of science. But it's not the foundation of biblical spirituality that has more realms that we interact with than just the natural. So... Let's take, for example, a story that probably many of us are familiar with. You remember young Samuel. He's about eight years old. He's growing up in the temple and uh, in the tabernacle. He's growing up and Eli is the high priest. And Samuel goes to bed one night and he hears his name being called. And he goes and he wakes up Eli. He says, Master, did you call me? He says, No, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. He goes back. He goes back to sleep. He gets woken up again. He goes back to Eli. Master, did you call me? And this time he has a little more discernment. He says, uh, no, I didn't call you, but if you hear your name called again, say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel goes back. He lays down. 
and he's woken up a third time by his name being called. He says, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. And the Lord begins to speak to him. This would have gone very different in America. See, Eli had enough wisdom. Even though he's wicked, he's not a good high priest, he's got a lot of problems, and he's about to get smacked down later in this chapter. Even though that's all true, he had at least enough wisdom to say, I'm not calling him, maybe the Lord is. So he gives him this little advice and sends him back to lay down. But let's say the same scenario were to take place and Eli has a Western rationalistic philosophy in his head. So Samuel comes in, says, Master, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. He comes in again. Master, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Let's take a look. He grabs a lamp, he lights his lamp, he walks around with Samuel to every corner of the tabernacle, he pulls up the cloth on the table of showbread, he says, look, there's nobody in here. I showed you every corner, I showed you every, every nook and cranny, there's nobody in here except you and me, and I didn't call you, so I'm going to tuck you back in bed real tight so you can't get out this time. Parents know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to tuck you in real tight. You're not getting up for a glass of water. You're not going to the bathroom one more time. You're not calling my name. It's just you and me. I didn't call you. Stay in bed. And we begin to have the Western rationalistic philosophy training of one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, the prophet Samuel. It's very different than Eli, who has at least enough insight to go, it might be the Lord talking to you. And so often it happens in our culture, more so with the monster side. The little Johnny comes running into your bedroom, ah, there's a monster under my bed or in my closet. And you go in, and you flip the lights on, you open the closet door, and you go, look, no monster. You pull up the cloth for the bed, you look underneath, look, no monster. It's in your imagination, it's not real, go to sleep, and don't pay attention to that again. And little Johnny has now learned not to trust his imagination. And that gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. Or it doesn't get reinforced to the point that the little Johnny believes it. He continues to see stuff, he stops sharing and he gets to about 14, 15 years old and now needs to be heavily medicated because we call it bipolar. Or a host of other names. And we're trying to medicate spiritual realities. Literally. Trying to medicate spiritual realities from people. Instead of having a more holistic approach, the little Johnny comes running in. You go, okay, let's take a look. You go in there. You sit down on the bed next to him. Okay, tell me what's in the closet. What do you see? It's about eight foot tall. It's green. It's got scales. It looks kind of like a dragon. But it's, it's like a man and it's a dragon. He's got these big teeth and these red eyes. And this is what he looks like. Okay, okay. Now, little Johnny, you remember last week we prayed and we invited Jesus into your heart? Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus, in your heart, has given you power over that monster in your closet. So here's, here's what we're going to do. You're going to pray, and you're going to command him to go. Okay. Lord Jesus, I command the, the monster dragon in my closet, I command him to go. In, in Jesus' name, amen. What happened, Johnny? It was amazing! He just went flying out the window. He looked really scared. See, you have authority over that, Johnny. You have the authority to do something about this. And now little Johnny does not grow up with some sort of spiritual warfare victim mentality for the next 40, 50 years. He has some identity, and he has some authority figured out, and he can continue to grow in that. And that's really a powerful foundation to start with. I'm excited to now have children. Children, 
child. <laughs> one one chillins. That's what you call it, right? We got one chillins. So turn with me to John chapter four and, and we're gonna switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about worship with the imagination because sometimes these get disconnected and it seems like we have our prophecy time and then we have our worship time and we have our teaching time and we have our offering time but this stuff really needs to flow together and so I want to share a, a story with you from John chapter 4 so look it up on your phone your iPad your MacBook your PC or your Bible if you brought it <laughs> that is the world we live in right now so John chapter 4, we have, I'll start this story, you have Jesus is talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. And as he's talking with her, which is interesting because not only is it offensive that he's talking with a Samaritan woman, so you have two different strikes there against Jesus, but he is talking about a racial debate with her. I don't know if you've ever caught that. But this is like a really touchy racial debate that they're having. And let's pick up in verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews complain that the, com claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Okay. Do you hear what she just said? She's laying down the gauntlet for Jesus here. Our fathers, our ancestors say that we worship here on this mountain. Your people, the Jews, say we have to worship in Jerusalem. She's making a kind of a debate that she's laying out here to see if he'll take the bait on this one. And then Jesus replies, Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know, that, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. All right, so she throws this out there. All right, Jesus, you know, you got the thing right about me and my husbands. You got that one. Well, let's see what you have to say about this. My people, the Samaritans, we worship on the mountain. Your people, the Jews, they say Jerusalem. Come on, you got something offensive to tell me? Or are we going to keep this conversation going? You seem like a really nice guy and you just called me out really, really strong here. And I, I'm just going to see where you're at. So she throws this down and he totally answers her. A lot of people think he sidestepped what she said. He absolutely gives her a very clear answer, and we've missed it. He tells her, it's not about the mountain, it's not about Jerusalem, the location you must worship is in the spirit realm. And the reason you're worshiping in the spirit realm is God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And there's been a lot of exegesis, a lot of teaching on this passage where they say, well, in the spirit means charismatic and in truth means Baptist. And you got to bring the two together. <laughs> right? Basically, that's how a lot of people have taken this passage apart. That, well, truth, that's going to be right doctrine and biblical memorization and Greek and Hebrew and blah, blah, blah. And in spirit means, you know, worship flags and stars of David and gallons of olive oil. And that's in spirit. And this is in truth. And we have to merge these two together. That's not what he's talking about. That's what we've kind of tried to make it fit for us. Because that's all that we've seen. 
But actually, the, the word spirit is pneuma. It's another word is used for breath. Pneuma. And you always have to look at the context of it because it could be the spirit realm. It could be the Holy Spirit. It could be the human spirit. It could even at times be a demonic spirit. Pneuma by itself just means spirit. So then you have to look when it says the fruit of the spirit, is it the fruit of the human spirit or is it the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And we have to look at context to get that's right. Even the Bible translators have struggled with this because when they put it in, if it's a capital S, the translator's saying that that pneuma means Holy Spirit. But then other versions of the same passage, maybe one is King James, one's NIV, and you put them together and one capitalizes the S and the other translators didn't capitalize it because they thought the context meant the other spirit or this spirit. So with that being said, what's our context? Our context of what the spirit is, is what is the truth? Truth here is aletheia. That's what the Greek word is, aletheia. Aletheia can mean realm or reality. So he's saying God is spirit and those who want to worship him must worship him in the Numa Alithia in the spirit realm. He's answering her debate about location. She's saying, Do we worship on the mountain? Do we worship in Jerusalem? No, you worship in the spirit realm. Because God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in the Numa Alithia, the spirit realm. And he's actually not sidestepping. He's giving her a really clear answer that we got confused about. So this pneuma alithia, this spirit realm, is... It's, it's a big shift away from the mountain or from the temple. To move into worshiping in the spirit realm. Wow. Wow. That's going to require every single one of us to have a lot more engagement with the spirit realm when it's time to worship. Because it's not about a system of killing goats and cows and chickens and all that stuff anymore. It's not that. It's totally been changed. And as it's been changed, everything has become, a part of this has become spiritual. We have, we have in Hebrews... Chapter 12, this amazing passage where the writer of Hebrews is contrasting the old covenant with this new covenant. And she, the writer is saying that there's such a difference because under the old, there was Mount Sinai, which trembled with fire and people were afraid and they backed away. And so you have this in chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no word be spoken further to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. But we get down to verse 22, and now he begins to describe our new covenant. And he says... But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The old picture of the old covenant is that God on the mountain is this scary person that people are backing away from and running from and they don't know how to interact with him. And he's saying, it is not like that. This thing, this time that's coming and has now come, when you come and you approach God now, you can come boldly before the throne. You can have your, your heart set at rest, it says in 1 John. How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we are called the sons of God. This is the, the, the God that we have now that we can come in boldly. 
there's there's concern about seeing in the spirit because there's this warped understanding of what God is even like. I mean, a lot of what we've we've shared, we've shared from the point that, well, people want to enter into the spirit and see. But there's still this terror, not just terror of seeing demons, but a terror of a father God that is scary and angry and ready to wipe you out. Now, I know this is a healthy congregation here. We have visitors from wherever, and I don't know what kind of background you grew up with, but, but we all have our own view of what God is like. And this is the right view. Now, you may have gotten yours somewhere else, but this one right here, he is trying to show you, you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. And he goes on with this description, but I had, I had an encounter where the Lord showed me a part of heaven that I, I don't frequent, <laughs> if I could say it that way. And this... This part was the joyful assembly. And I, I just remember walking in and just how much joy and cheer and, and just celebration of this wonderful family and father that we have. And it was like an atmosphere that you could come out of it and just be like buzzing for a week because of the energy and the joy and the... And... and the, the blood that's there that speaks a better word than Abel. See, the blood of Abel spoke of the guilt of Cain who killed him. The blood cried from the ground a, a word of justice and vindication. But the blood of Jesus that cries from the ground is a, of forgiveness and cleansing. It's a blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's not unforgiveness and vindication. It's blood that speaks of you are vindicated and you're forgiven. It's a whole different word. It's so much better. You've been cleansed of that. The angels are just happy and they're ready for you to come join the joyful assembly. Woo! A couple more points and we're going to switch into the activation time. But this... This concept of worshiping in the spirit realm. We want to do it. Maybe there's a passion, a hunger, especially after the last several days, there's something built up. I want to worship in the spirit realm. What does that mean? How many shofars do I need to buy? <laughs> Not what we're talking about. So, what I am talking about is this this concept of worshiping the spirit realm. See, this was understood in the first century. Say, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit in on the Lord's day. We learn a couple things from that. One, he wasn't in the spirit all the time. Now, I know that that's hard for some of us because we're thinking, well, we're supposed to be in the spirit. You're supposed to walk in the spirit all the time that's true according to what it talks about in galatians 5 walk in the spirit but he's actually going into a visionary encounter in a place called the spirit realm he's entering inside of it and although there's there's a lot of teaching that makes it seem like we're supposed to do that 24 hours a day john knew that wasn't true he went into the spirit and other times he may have washed dishes he went into the spirit, but at other times he may have been feeding the poor. There's, there's time that you go into visionary encounters, but this whole idea of, of someday I will live entirely in the clouds in my mind because I've become so prophetic that I'm always in the third heaven and I'm never in the first heaven at all is not how he built you or else he never would have given us a planet earth to put us here on. So we're here, and it's just as spiritual to go push your child on the swing while walking in the Spirit than to also have some heavenly encounter over here. It's us that have divided these things up. And, and whether, whether we're living our life here and loving the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's honoring to Him. Taking care of your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, is honoring to Him. 
It's just as honoring when I go for a run to take care of my body as it is when I get up to preach. And we're the ones that divided that apart from itself. And they, are, they go together. And we've, we've torn all these things and we've separated them out and they don't end up healthy when you do that. We have to bring this stuff back together. So he knew how to go in and he wasn't always in. That's the other point. He knew how to go in. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So it's the Lord's Day. I'm going into the Spirit. Now I need to come out and wash some dishes for the other people on the island of Patmos with me. However that works, you know. But he knew how to go in and he knew how to come out. And he didn't always live in a third heaven vision. He just wrote a really good one down and we got his journal. Which is awesome. So, my last point is this, is that, and this, if you get nothing else, which I know you did get something else, but if you get nothing else, get this sentence. Write it down, tattoo it on your arm, tattoo it on your neighbor's arm, whatever you need to do, get the sentence I'm about to give you. Physical acts of obedience done in faith release spiritual realities. Physical acts of obedience done in faith release spiritual realities. Now if someone can make that into a haiku for me, that would be fantastic. That would be so much fun. Do you guys know what a haiku is? Okay, then more of you should have laughed. Um, so <laughs> this, this concept, here's what I'm saying. And we do this in some of our spirituality, but this is a major key. Every church I've gone to, I, I can say that I really do believe that's an accurate blanket statement. Every church I go to has at least one person that's seeing stuff in the spirit. Usually, it's, it's Elder Susie, it's, it's some random person that everybody knows, Elder Susie sees angels. And once in a while, Elder Susie will be given the microphone, if she doesn't have a shofar or a tambourine with her, and, and she's going to share with us what she saw that Sunday. So Elder Susie, she gets up and she goes, you know, ah, oh, there's 12 giant angels and they're doing this and they got swords and they're doing this and they're doing this. And everyone's like, yay, Elder Susie, thank you for telling us again what we saw, what you saw last week and the week before. We still have no idea what to do with it. And maybe you're a hungry person who's like, I want to see what Elder Susie sees. But after a while, it becomes like an inoculation. And you're kind of like, Nothing, good for you, Elder Susie, but nothing ever happens. You get up and you share it, and what? Good for you. You feel better that you see stuff, and we all know you see stuff, so you must be amazing, and we must be losers, is the thought that eventually gets there. I have seen this so much, and it's the thing that has to happen is we have to understand how to take what's in the spirit realm and get it into the physical realm. If there's a warehouse full of body parts that a whole bunch of people, including myself, have seen in the spirit realm, why is that warehouse not empty? There's something of a disconnect that we go, it's there, we know there's something that works for us, but we can't get it over here. And it's not coming over. Where's, where's the provision that there's giant mounds of Scrooge McDuck-sized buildings of money over here and riches in glory and we can't get it over here? And the phrase I just told you is how this works. That's the key to transferring from there to here. That's the statement you need. Physical acts of obedience done in faith release spiritual realities. We understand this in other areas, but we've compartmentalized it. So, let me give you an example. Uh, it, most people, especially in our culture of, of you know, Christianity that's been flattened, we know everybody gets saved when they repeat after me, right? 
Repeat after me. Say the prayer. You say, you know, help me Jesus, I'm a sinner. Help me Jesus, I'm a sinner. You know, ABCs. You go through them and you pray this prayer and now you got it. It's not the magic prayer. If you stumble over the words, you could still get saved. If you said the words in French, you could still get saved. It's not the magic words. It's not a perfect language. It's not that you said it in Hebrew that made it work. There's something of what's happening is you are doing a physical act of obedience. You are flapping your tongue. Blah, blah, blah. And you're flapping it as a physical act of obedience in faith. And that released the spiritual reality into you becoming regenerate and born again and having a supernatural mystical experience that changes you entirely into a new person called a new creation. How did that happen? It was not the magic prayer. It wasn't the right language. It wasn't that you didn't stumble over your words. It's that you did a physical act of obedience. Blah, blah, blah. Done in faith that released the spiritual reality of that experience into your life. And we have it and we're like, wow, awesome. And it's no longer what it used to be where you'd have, you know, these meetings where, where people would just wait and wait and hope that conviction would rest on you enough that you'd finally approach the altar and get saved. We came to understand, you pray this with me in faith and you'll get it. And we had, before, we had a whole different encounter. It used to literally take weeks for enough conviction to hit someone's heart for them to now cry out. And then they would get saved. And they had what were called um, the, the anxiety bench. The, the anxious bench at revivals where you'd sit there and you'd, you'd sit there if you were one who might get saved. You had been thinking about it. You'd been considering it. And you'd sit there until enough conviction of the Holy Spirit came on you that then you would pray and cry out to God and you'd maybe feel a assurance. But we've come to a whole new level of understanding where I can lead you in this and you can have it transfer into your life immediately. The same is true of all other things. Except we haven't learned the same process. I'll give you a few more examples. Water baptism. It's a physical act of obedience done in faith that releases a spiritual reality. Otherwise, you're just getting a really poor bath. <laughs> with a bunch of other people in choir gowns. This is so different to think that you're actually doing a physical act of obedience done in faith and it's going to release a spiritual reality into your life that cuts off the old man and says, I'm leaving that behind and I'm going forward united with his resurrection. That's very different than just getting wet. The, the concept even of, and this, this one is where I understand about giving for me, you could throw money in a bucket every week and it's not going to go so well for you. Or you could put money in as a physical act of obedience done in faith and release spiritual reality into your life. And a lot of people have turned it into, well, it's one of the rules I got to follow. And when it's one of the rules you follow, that's not something that he's getting behind. That's not something the Lord blesses. But he always meets that and releases that thing when you operate in a physical act of obedience done in faith. He releases spiritual reality. It's, it's that thing that transfers it from there to here. Even the concept of, of how Jesus did healings. You look at what he did. He always engaged a physical act of obedience done in faith. Released the spiritual reality. Pick up your mat and walk. How about I get up and start walking and then I'll come back for my mat? I mean, you ever think about that? If you're the lame guy, you're like, really? I mean, rolling up my mat is a little bit of work here with the legs that don't work. Could we get our priorities straight, Jesus? Like, could we roll up the mat after you heal my legs? But he says, no, do this first. 
He takes a guy who's blind, he takes some dirt, he spits, he makes some mud, he packs it on his face and tells him, go wash off your face. Have you ever thought about how crazy that must have been to actually stand there and watch it? You brought your blind friend to the meeting and Jesus is like, <laughs> slap some mud on your face and tell you to go wash your face off. Okay. He doesn't say, I 100% guarantee that you're about to be healed as soon as you go wash your face off. He just says, now go wash your face off. That is a very tense five minutes for those 12 disciples. <laughs> We're going to be in a lot of trouble. He just spits on blind people. I don't know if you get this. Jesus did not mind offending people. It was just amazing the way he did his ministry so you have you have all of these examples how does this apply to the worshiping in spirit and truth how does this apply to the supernatural in other ways what i've come to understand is that when sister susie when elder susie gets up and shares we all go okay that's great but we don't do anything this is the missing piece that we have to get. What is the physical act of obedience that we need to do in faith to release that spiritual reality into this realm? Because it could be that, that you get some dirt and you spit in it and you put it on their face and that's the thing that Jesus had to do for that blind person to be healed. What is it that we have to do to bring that reality into this reality? What is the physical act of obedience we have to do in faith to release the spiritual reality? And that is such a missing key because there's risk involved. There's risk that the unbeliever is going to sit there and say a magic prayer and nothing's going to happen and no assurance of salvation is going to happen and they're going to go, now I just made my good friend think that I'm a Christian, but nothing happened in my heart. Or I'm going to get in the, in the tub and I'm on, only going to get wet and that's all that happens. Or I'm just going to keep throwing money in here and believing and I'm going to be made out to be a fool. And because of fear, we don't take that risk. And so fear of, of loss or fear of failure or fear of God not meeting it holds us back from doing the physical act of obedience in faith that we need to do to release the spiritual reality. So, inside of that concept, what I want to do tonight is we're going to map out what is actually in the spirit in this room. Then we're going to activate by becoming aware of it and connecting that realm to this realm. So, uh, someone can someone bring the whiteboard down here for me? That would be tremendously helpful. Chad, maybe you could grab that whiteboard and bring it down. And Josh could give you a hand. Thank you so much. And excellent. Thank you. So, just bring it down here next to me to my left. And uh, we're going to use this to help us in our process. And what we have on the whiteboard is my wife has drawn out a basic blueprint of this room. Now what we do with our empty blueprint is we're going to ask the Lord to show us what's in the room, in the spirit. And then we're going to begin to map it out. All right. Oh, look at that. Tripods with cameras and everything. So, I have probably done this 50 times. I'm just going to take a guess. That's about right over the last five years or so. And every single time is different and stunning and amazing. And it's every location is different. Every group of people is different. And what the Lord shows is always different. There are certain things that I've found to be kind of patterns of how the Lord reveals certain things. But I don't want to tell you the patterns and get you stuck in some little box in your head. So we're going to just leave that there. But here's what we do. We take a few minutes and we're going to close our eyes and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show us what is in this room right now. 
And I know we have people watching online. You're not in the room with us at the moment. It's okay. You can, you can look around the room even in your heart. You can just close your eyes and take a look and see the room and see the room based on the blueprint and ask the Lord to even show you what is in this room. You may not be able to see the board. That's okay. But regardless, you can join in too. And then as we get things down on the board, the cool thing about what we're about to do is it gives you confirmation because it's not just Elder Susie that's been seeing. You've been seeing and you've never gotten confirmation that you're seeing. Tonight's a major confirmation for you. You're going to hear, wow, that's in the room? I didn't know that, but I kind of felt like it was there. And you become more aware. So here's what we do. I'm going to call on you to tell me what's in the room in just a couple minutes. And between now and then, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what's in the room. Go ahead and close your eyes. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. And Lord, you've so turned up the level in this group already. And Lord, as, as we sit and wait, I just ask that you would begin to reveal what is in this room, what is in the air, what is in the chairs, what's in the aisles, what's on the stage, the things that are within this room. Lord, we ask for detail. guest, but we want those first impressions that the Lord showed you. And you may not understand what you saw, but there may be five other people in the room that saw the same thing, and one of them might have more information. See, the thing about this is that in the same way that prophecy, you prophesy in part, you know in part, you also discern in part, and you know in part. So there's going to be people that see things that you didn't see. They have a different part. At first, when you're just getting started, it can make you very insecure because this person over here saw 20 things and you only saw 15. And you're like, oh, why did I miss those five? You're going to. You're designed that way that we have the whole body to work together to discern things. Just let that go. It's okay. You got your part of what you saw. They have their part of what they saw as well as they may see the same thing only a little different because the Lord's talking to them in a different way. So those are some practicals. A couple more is that we are not looking for 
prophecy over other individuals in the room right now. We're not looking for prophecy over Florence, Alabama. We're not looking for what did you see in the other rooms of this building or on the roof of this building or under the floor of this building or in the car in the parking lot. We are looking for what the Lord showed you inside this room. I give this parameter because it saves us a lot of time rather than being all over with this scattered kind of approach. We're asking the Lord what's inside this room. Now with that, we're also, we're, what we're really discerning in this room is mainly going to be angels. Don't be afraid if you're the first person to say, I see an angel. That's what the Lord probably just showed a lot of people in the room. The other thing is that the Holy Spirit manifests in a lot of ways. You might have saw fire, water, cloud, lightning, thunder. You, if you saw thunder, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I didn't take good earth science. But, <laughs> but you, you get what I'm saying? It could be wine. It could be a lot of things. We're not that Pentecostal. It could be wine. Um, it, it could be a lot of different things. That That's how the Holy Spirit shows himself. And so uh, it, it could be a lot of things. And so we just want to know that the playing field is wide open, what he showed you. It's safe. This is a safe room to practice sharing what you saw, and then we can activate these things. So um, Karen, would you help draw on the board for me? We're going to mark down what you share that you saw. And as we go, I'm going to need a handheld mic and someone to run it around. Jake, are you going to help me out? Awesome. Cool. All right. So here's what we'll do. I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds to look again. Maybe you haven't seen something or maybe something I just took off your list and you want to see something more. Close your eyes again. Lord, we just welcome you to show anyone who didn't see something yet. Or even if, if they just lost the things on their list and their prophecy over Florence for another time, Lord, that you'd show them something in this room right now. All right, amen. Okay, so here's how we do this. Raise your hand. And you're going to be called on. He'll bring the microphone to you so it can actually make it to the webcast watchers. So wait for him to get it to you. Talk clearly into the mic, please, so people can be blessed everywhere they're watching. And as we do this, take no more, no more than one minute to share. Shorter is better, but share as quickly as you can in one minute. Jake, call on whoever is closest. Uh, I, I didn't see clearly, but standing right behind your wife, uh, that location, there's about an eight foot angel standing there. Excellent. That's all so I saw. she'll put that down on the board, an eight foot angel. Now, how many of you wave a hand if you saw it in the same location? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, at least five. Excellent. Uh, right here, this gentleman. Um, I had my eyes just shut asking the Lord to just show me what was in the room. Uh, in my mind's eye, what I saw is across the whole top perimeter of the room, I saw uh, bows that were stretched back and they were loaded with arrows. You could actually hear the string, uh, the tension on the string uh, ready to shoot, but the, the tips of the arrows had a uh, flame of fire on it. So they were pointed in or out? In towards us. <laughs> in towards us what do you think the Lord's showing you um, the impression I got was that uh, the anointing that the Lord had placed on everybody over the weekend um, that tonight he was going to release and combine not just the anointing but the fire with the anointing and get everybody really lit up amazing hands. thank you for pushing a little further sometimes that's what it takes is what it's a few extra questions so you don't feel threatened you actually have a good word <laughs> I, was, I was like arrows at us <laughs> That's so good. Um, I guess we'll keep going down the road there for a moment. Okay. Um, I actually saw 
four different things. Okay. Um, I saw an angel walking back and forth, like right around where he saw the eight foot angel, uh-huh. and I saw it tilling the ground and planting seeds and watering the seeds, and they were coming up. And I asked him what was going on, and he said that um, he was raising up worship, releasing worship. Um, and I saw a really big angel up there, and he had huge wings that were the size up on the roof, like that were um, the top of the sanctuary, like the size of the entire sanctuary, and he was just waving them down towards us. And I asked him what he was doing, and he said that he was releasing revelation to us just during this time. And um, I saw two angels on on each side running up and down like two over here and two over there running up and down the the um the aisles and um i asked them what they were doing and they said that they were um bringing people lost people up to the front to um give their hearts to the lord um and there were so many they had to run like just sprinting um and i saw another angel like right there where the podium is just standing there like really like seven or eight feet tall just standing there with a big sword and i asked him why he was there and he said he was waiting for just um the intercessors to go to war with them and to go to battle with them excellent very good and right here and then we're going to move down to this section where we got a pocket here we'll take a turn I saw another about eight foot angel right in front of where the piano is, like kind of in between the piano and the middle microphone. And both that angel and this one, I saw this one more clear, but both of them were flapping their wings. And during worship, they were flapping them. And in the beginning, they were wor- they were flapping them a little bit, um, like not extremely hard, but I could feel the wind. And I was asking. I just kind of thought that was cool. And then the Lord's like, well, don't you want to know what they're doing? And I said, yeah. And so he's like, well, they're fanning the flame. They're fanning the flame of, uh, of just that intimacy with the Lord and a desire and a longing for Christ and, um, and the presence of God. And later on in the service... I um, I saw them flapping their wings harder, and I felt more wind. And I was like, "What are they doing now?" And he's like, "Well, the flame's grown, so now they have to flap them harder." <laughs> Did you see a color with that angel? Uh, just white. Okay, just white. All right. So if you can come down here, yeah, there we go. Start wherever. Just this front corner has a few. All right. Um, I saw. Really, besides angels just all over the place, the biggest things that I saw was uh, water on the ground um, up to ankle length and stuff. I could actually feel it flowing over uh, and see it all over the place, Uh, just preparing, uh, like cleansing people's feet, preparing them for a new walk. Is it moving from a certain direction? Where are you seeing it? It's pooling? actually kind of just flowing from the back, kind of like it's like it is downhill, just kind of flowing over in like a forward uh, type direction. Okay. Um, the ne- the next thing I see is just uh, red, green, and blue balloons all over the room. Okay. <laughs> what do you think that means? Any thoughts? That there is a Holy Ghost party up in here. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Allie? I saw an angel and his wings, like, kind of like yours. Like, he's, like, up there, and his wings are as wide as the room, and he's flying back and forth, and he's releasing something. And um, I saw an angel, like, on either side of the stage, and there's just fire. Like, there's a wall of fire right there, like, in front of the stage. In front of the stage, like, where the steps are. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Courtney? Okay, so I've been feeling angels here uh, since I moved here, and so, um, but angels very strongly. Uh, the other night I like heard them singing; it was amazing. Um, but I closed my eyes, and what I really saw was the cameras uh, represent like Earth, uh, nations, and just you know, just another eye. And then um, I really kept seeing the stage and the stairs, and how the stairs go down in their bars representing like a prison and like how they go down is representing like chains falling off mm. and like God just wrought in grace on the altar. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Um, who else had their hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I, I saw a specific being right there. It didn't kind of look like an angel, though. It was weird. It's actually very thin, tall, but its feathers are very distinct. It might have had eyes on its feathers. And behind it, in the center, uh, on each side of the side of that, of just right there, in the middle, were two angel. Uh, I don't even want to say they're angels, um, but they had lion's heads. Um, and they kind of, they were just on their knees and forearms. So I, then I saw a big bucket pouring. Um, I did see uh, 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 electric honey as a foundation, but then electric neon blue water on top. And then I also saw a big angel, and the roof was actually open to the side. And there was a huge angel, uh, probably about, say, like 30 stories high. I knew it's not to focus outside, but because the, the ceiling was open, I'm going to include that with it. Um, and there was a specific angel guarding that door that was hovering. Uh, mm. It was like a ball shape of fire. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Uh, did you have your hand up? We'll go here, and then we're, we'll work our way toward the back, too. That's funny he said that. I seen um, an angel, probably as tall as the room, with a sword. Mm. And the sword was probably as almost as long as the angel, and he had a helmet and a blue vest. Just a helmet guy. and a blue vest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, let's pause for a moment. We're going to switch gears a little bit. And I just want to ask, if you saw something in the aisles, raise your hand. Okay, Jake's going to get a couple of those. Let's hear what's in the aisle next. We both sort of saw the same thing. We saw the water coming down the aisles. And I also saw water coming out of the stage and coming, running down the steps. So it was water coming up from the top all the way down in the aisles and underneath the seats. And then water coming out of the stage as well. Okay, excellent. And uh, how many other people saw water coming down the aisles? Yeah, I figured there's a lot of that. If you saw something else coming down the aisles, raise your hand for Jake. Behind you, Jake, you have a couple there. Well, this sounds so unspiritual. I saw children's squeaky toys, yellow and red, all up and down the aisles. <laughs> and any thought on that? Uh, what come to mind was that God's going to release children to come and go and minister and just be happy and play. Mm, uh, excellent, excellent. Okay. And, uh, yeah, building on the same question. Yeah, I saw a, a um, rainbow coming from about, about the middle of the stage going over into the aisle over here with a pool of water in, uh, in it. Excellent. So from this side of the stage to that aisle right wow okay okay uh who else for jake for that that topic before we change gears down here yeah keep keep your hand up so jake can find you <laughs> let's make his job easy i saw people laying in the aisles like just like face down crying like that's where i saw the water coming from mm. but, yeah you saw the water coming from the people, people laying down yeah, crying whoa did you catch that mmm very good very good um, let's get over here to Gary uh, I saw angels coming in in the back doors uh, some looked like they were very heavily armed uh, and uh, with you know in pretty tall uh, and uh, they were kind of just coming in, and uh, you could tell they were ready to really just get the business. There were two uh, angels on the stage that were uh, kind of they seemed to be working with all the other angels that are in the room. And the angels, on the, the angels on the stage, the two on the stage were on each side of the stage, and they were as tall as uh, the, the building is. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there were also angels. One I saw, like one at every station for uh, each uh, person in the worship team. They were uh, they worshipped with uh, the team, uh, and and all these together seemed to work together uh, wow. for uh, I don't know for the ministry. I guess. But, wow. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's go right back here. When worship started, um, I sat down and asked the Lord to show me the angels and. I closed my eyes and what I saw on the right side of my vision was a white swirl. And the, I asked the Lord what it was and he said that it was, he said there's angels, like single angels, like all the way down the front of the, of the aisle and they're all spinning 
during the worship. Each one of them, they're just spinning and spinning mm. and spinning in worship to the Lord. Mm. So good. All right, we'll, we'll pause on the aisles now for a minute. We'll change direction a little bit. If you saw something in front of the front row, up to the base of the stage, somewhere in here, that's what we want some descriptions. Raise your hands for Jake to come find you. Marsha, you get to go first. I saw an angel, like a really tall angel, pouring out on in the center a bucket, and it started like a drop of water, but it turned into like a tsunami. It was just like powerful. And then the same, except the buckets that were pouring in out blue paint and yellow paint, and it was revelation and joy. Revelation and joy. Ooh, nice. Uh, Micah, here. Okay. It it actually wasn't just in here it like took up that whole entire section over there the left side and uh it was just this gigantic glass of ice water and i thought that was really weird <laughs> it was just huge and it took up the entire side and uh when i asked what it was, it was for people who work outside especially around here there's nothing better than like a cold cold glass of water and I just kept hearing that like, refreshing over and over, like that's the refreshing mm -hmm. corner over there. Refreshing. And during worship all the time, I look over there and I'll most of the time over on that side see people just like, oh, more than over <laughs> on this side. So it was just, it was really funny. But, that is awesome. And I'll, I'll share one of the places that we went and did this, um, same kind of activation. It was in a room about the fourth the size of this sanctuary. It's a very small, like church basement kind of room. And we're doing the same activation. And, um, up front they had this big purple like tornado thing that was like a worship vortex basically and so when we released everyone for activation time some of the people went up and got in the worship vortex but in the back of the room which is only about 60 feet away there was a few couches and people had said that that zone was like a rest zone and so there were about eight people back sitting in, in chairs and around those couches in that area and within a few minutes we have we're blasting worship music up here and people are dancing around screaming like crazy people and 60 feet away you can hear them snoring in this section back here because when you're actually entering into that realm in that location that thing you get to participate in it so they're in the rest zone and they are out cold so those kind of zones are really important too so uh yeah keep wave, wave at jake here for more about the front i saw here in the front like uh, it's like traffic like cars and uh just going back and forth real fast here in the front cars traffic mm -hmm. what 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 are you getting about it what i think it's like uh just like ministry has been sent out from right here oh ministries being sent out from the front of the sanctuary now that there's a lot more to that right there that is a good word oh we'll take that for sure I sensed bright light coming down here you sense what coming down bright light oh a bright light okay coming down yes then I felt cool coolness in my body and also I, I smell beautiful smell and I saw huge angel standing over there wow. releasing something wow oh two angels are releasing something and you were smelling it as well and feeling cool in your body how many of you are also smelling something in this area yes yes excellent okay let's take a moment close your eyes and just take three deep breaths through your nose Who smelled something that time? Huh? A lot more in this section. Same area. Interesting. I don't know what to do with what we just found out, but there's something going on here. We've we've had we've had a couple people uh, at a previous location. They said they felt wind, and I said, "Okay, everybody, put your hands up, and we'll just we'll just pay attention for a moment." And we just followed that, kind of tuned to what they were feeling. 
And I said, okay, Lord, if there's wind, let us feel it. And it was about 150 people. Everybody felt cool breeze go over their hands. So sometimes it's just paying attention to it. Once you have just one person that's got it, and other people lining up going, okay, let's see what's going on here. And checking it out. We went from three or two people, I think, saying to how many that time? It was like five or six. Raise your hand. So we just have to pay attention. What? Yes. My wife has brilliant questions such as, what did you smell? Any idea? Like sweet uh, pastries. Nut, nutmeg, sweet pastries, and um, it smells like a sweet flower, but it's 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 sweet, but it's not a flower. That's why I'm thinking mm. like a pastry. Okay. <laughs> now it could be different. So, Allie, what did you smell? I smelled like minty, like refreshing, like kind of Vaseline, just that refreshing smell that like just cools you. Is that why you were getting something like that too? I don't know how to, I was saying it's weird because it's both, like I don't know how to describe that, but at the same time it's almost like a sugary kind of smell, but the, and then it's also this minty kind of cool freshness. So it's like a minty sweet tea like right the best yeah. gum you've ever had. Maybe, maybe that's what's life. in your giant yeah. glass, Micah. Alabama <laughs> sweet. <laughs> that's right, Alabama. Okay, so Pete, do you have something you want to add? Let's run a mic up to Pete. Come on. For those who can't see on the camera, Pete Garza of Radio Air Jesus is about to talk. I smelt alcohol like when you walk into a hospital. And I smelt, uh, there was like the medicine of the, of the cleanliness, but I smelt alcohol. And I just felt like the Lord was saying there's a, there's a, a healing wave that is being released. Yeah, wow. so there, there's there's an authority that God's releasing right now in healing, and I, I believe because it was smelt up here that this is going out to the nations right now. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Liz, back here. I actually saw um, what I thought was like a hospital, or I actually saw like the Red Cross symbol, and I was thinking it was like a hospital, and somebody said that. I was like, yeah, wow. that's exactly what it was. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, this, some of this stuff we haven't had show up in other churches before. This is pretty amazing. Um, it's always amazing, but wow. Um, all right, let me change gears just a little bit again. Uh, on the stage. What are you getting on the stage? We'll do about four of those. Um, I saw on the stage there is a a sword that is as tall as the room and it is wrapped in fire and it was just it was blowing um, in a circular pattern around the sword and over the handle just um, back right behind the main wow. microphone excellent excellent any thought on what not a clue not okay. a clue okay good that's fine we don't want to make stuff up so <laughs> we'll go down here we just say what we see and what we understand, and that's that's great. Okay, so whenever you first told us to uh, close our eyes, uh, first time without knowing about looking outside the room and everything, um, I could look on the stage, and uh, right there where the middle mic is was this big golden throne, and then on the left side and the right side were uh, kind of smaller golden thrones um, with Jesus on the right, the Holy Spirit on the left, and God in the middle. Wow. Wow. How many of you, wave your hand if you picked up on something very similar to that. Let's see. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Joanne? Well, I've seen an angel sitting on top of Jake's drum thing. And you, anybody that knows Jake, he can be cocky. And this angel was sitting there and he was like going, swinging his feet, you know, and going, yeah, let's get it, you know. So. <laughs> That's when they're supposed to hit me, right there. <laughs> Joanne, we said we weren't giving personal words to people. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> we'll, we'll use the word confident. Uh, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> This is what is so funny, is that I've never seen anything on his drum cage before, and I saw an angel at first, and then I looked again, and it was a white horse prancing on top of the drum cage, and prancing to the rhythm of the drum, the what? drums on top of the drum wow. cage. And all I heard was like, you know, like, climb on and come up to where I am and stuff. So wow. that's what, and, they, and it had wings, so I probably looked at it again, and it was like, oh, that's a horse. Ah, yeah. hey. The horse had wings? Yes. Wow, wow, some Pegasus stuff. Um, let's go here to Christy. I saw an angel in the center of the stage. Uh, it was in gold and white, and I asked what his purpose was, and he was bringing harmony amongst not the music, but the worship team member. He brought a, pure, a pureness and a harmony. Actually, I heard that he was making a war for it. Like he was standing guard to unblocking um, the discord of the enemy and keeping a pureness amongst them. Wow. Wow. Okay. We could go till this turns into a lock-in. So, <laughs> maybe the next time I come, we, well, well, we could plan on it. But, uh, <laughs> well, for tonight, we're going to pause right there. And uh, here's what we'll do next. So we have a very full board. Thank you, Karen. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. Look at all that. That is quite a board. You should have, you know, make sure you visit the board and just take a look at what everybody's called out inside this room. Now, here's what we do. If... Um, if you guys can cue up some worship music in the back, and we're looking for some upbeat stuff. So if you have, I don't know if you know a worship band that's really good at playing upbeat, good worship from Florence, Alabama, that you could pick out on your CD and put in, that would be great. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have some music in a few minutes here, and what we're going to do is we are going to ask our other seers to come join me now. Take Come on up here, guys. Gary, Louise. And I'll need a handheld mic. Jake, awesome. I th yeah, that's great. Okay. So normally what I do at this point is I have already written down in my iPad what I have seen in this room. Now you've all shared, and then I share what I see in the room. That will help bring confirmation, encouragement to what you saw. So, we get to do it on a whole other level, though, because we have a couple other seers to share what they saw. So, I'll just share what I have written down, and then I'll let you guys share. What I have here, uh, the first thing was burning lava that I saw coming down the aisles. Did anybody else see something like that, or maybe you called it a river of fire coming down the aisles? Okay. I've seen rivers of fire before, but this was like... It was so liquidy that uh, lava was the word that I picked out for that. It was just, it was just flowing down in a very unusual way. I don't. Uh, Karen's seen me do this activation before. I don't think I've ever mentioned lava. So there's something really. What I got about the interpretation of the lava is that it's exotic. It's very unique. It's unusual that that's part of this place. That the fire of fervent worship is something different than just plain old fire. It's like sticky fire, like lava. It's, it's not the kind of fire that you can wave your hand through and go, hey, look at me, I'm a dumb preteen. It's not, it's not like that. You can't do that with lava. It's, it's so transferable and so sticky that when people are coming down the aisle for worship, that they're walking through this lava and it's getting on them. And the closer they get, the more it's getting on them. So that was the first thing. The second is that down front is water, about knee high, and the water is actually steaming because of this, this lava pouring into it. It was joining the water, and the water wasn't just like, like a cool, refreshing water. I was getting it's actually like, like the kind of thing that once you're down here, you actually breathe it. 
you're actually getting it into your lungs and you're feeling the whole atmosphere because of the steam and the water and the lava mixed together. So it gets in you and it gets all through you with the steam. The third thing I saw is on, on stage there are four large sparkling angels, which I haven't seen before. Uh, like that. I may be one in a service, but to have four is, is pretty astounding to me. And these four large sparkling angels, there's something about the, um, th there's something about what they're carrying that's connected to the worship that's a big part of this house, that, that, that that's what this is known for, is the worship in this house. And that that is, is, is reflective, it's radiant, it's something that's beautiful and draws people in. Because it's not just an angel that's intimidating or strong or powerful or scary, but it's like a, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a majestic sense of his presence that is connected to that. And then the fourth was hanging above the seats at about head level is like a thick cloud of smoke. It's the kind of thing that, that if you're in your seat during worship, you're in the presence, but it's also kind of like this cloudy, smoky presence. And I'm not sure why that is, but it's like a you're in it, but then when you step out in the aisle, it's like your head clears and you're now going to go down front for worship. And those are your two options, it seems like. Either you're in this cloud and, and it's in your head and you're like, hmm, or you're out here and it's it's cleared and you got to get pulled down here for worship. So it's kind of one or the other in this in this room, in the atmosphere. So with that, would one of you like to go first? All right, then. Okay. Is this on? Okay. Yeah, come on um, over into the light. For what, I, what I saw as I was sitting there, and I think this, this has to do with the, the local church, not just this particular meeting. But a real large uh, an angel as high as the ceiling, right over on this side and one over on this side. And as I looked at them, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but and the, as I kept looking at them, slowly they turned to fire. And... God really wants to release his fire in this place. But like on a, on a totally different level than what we normally think. And I'm not sure what that means. And then um, they're uh, sitting on the top row here, <clears throat> all the way across, just a bunch of angels. And they were just sitting there looking. And they were talk to each other. And they would point. And I was thinking, you know, what is, what is that about? Well, they were pointing out some who are not doing what there's to do. <laughs> and that through these, through these series of meetings, but again, it's not only for this conference, but it's for this church. That so many people are going to become activated so that these angels are not sitting any longer, but they're co-laboring with you. Yeah, I actually saw some of the same things that they both were kind of saying. Um, I saw two angels standing in the corner, just standing and just watching. And then I saw them turn into water. I saw them turn into fire. I saw them turn into... And then they were air, and then the angel was back. And I just saw them, like, almost, like, just changing form. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I love seeing stuff like that. And then I saw four angels on the stage. And the only way I could think of describing them was, like, diamonds. Like, they... like. Yeah, four angels, like, and they were like, the way that I thought about it, I don't know if you guys have seen X-Men, where there's that girl that she changes, like, into diamond, and then, like, when the people try and shoot at her, it just bounces off because it was diamond, and I was like, oh, that's kind of like X-Men, like, that was my first thought about it, because I, I love those kind of movies, and then I also saw an angel um, kind of, like, flying across the ceiling with, like, these huge wings, and he was just kind of flapping them, and just kind of being there, and just kind of, um, yeah, and then I also saw this little bitty angel sitting right here and he was just sitting and he was like swinging his legs and he was just like looking at everybody 
And he was just like, and he'd turn around, and he would like look at Jonathan, and he'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'd turn around, and he'd just like watching. And I was like, what is he doing? What is he doing? And I, I still don't know. And he was just like, I just want to be here. I just want to be here. And he was just turning around, and he was just like, I think he cared about the excitement of God. Because he was so excited. Like, I was almost like, calm down. It's going to be okay. Like, just calm down. And then, how oh, else? I also saw the angels sitting. Um, but I saw them sitting on, like, different rows and just kind of, like, almost moving because they were, like, just excited. They were, like, on the top. And then, like, just, like, like he said, just waiting, waiting for, waiting, waiting for someone to partner with them, someone to get up and be like, I want to get that. And they're like, yeah, like, I'll, I'll join in with that. I'll join in with that. And then, was that, I think, I think that was the bait. I saw lots of movement. I felt lots of movement and all that kind of stuff. But that was kind of like the main things that God was really highlighting to me. Okay. Yeah, guys, hang out. Just hang on just a minute. So here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to, um, if you are a parent, you have children, uh, stand to your feet. I'm going to have that group next stand up. Okay. As long as you have children. They could be 80 years old. <laughs> you had some interesting ages here, if that's true. <laughs> Nobody should feel excluded at that point. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here is I want uh, Louise to uh, pray a prayer of impartation specifically because of uh, the different things like the children's toys in the aisle and what's being released. I want to release that over the parents and over the families and over the children, and I'm going to have Louise do that for me here. Here, God, I just pray an impartation over every parent in this room right now. That every parent would just be able to go home and just talk to their kids and just start talking to them about this stuff. And just start sharing with them. And even if their kids are in their 30s or in their 40s, just that, that blessing to be able to just sit with their kids and just be able to talk to them about it. And we just pray for such an impartation just to come over them now. I just had this picture of this impartation coming like, just like honey, just like pouring over your head and then just like trickling down. So God, we just bless that. We just bless, we just bless every parent in the room right now. We bless them for being a parent. Because just being a parent is such an incredible job. And we just bless that. And we thank you for what you're doing. And I just pray for an impartation. Mm, amen. And if, if you have a physical need in your body for healing, stand to your feet. If you don't, you can sit back down. Um, but, but those who have a need, stay standing. If you have a need, stand up as well. And we're going to pray this over even the, the viewers at home as well because of the, uh, the word from Pete Garza regarding healing being sent out as a, as a hospital, the smell he was picking up on and, and that word. We want to speak that healing over those in this room, but also uh, no matter where you are. So no matter where you are, if you can appropriately put a hand on the illness in your body please do so right now as we pray over you and we, let's just extend our hands toward him right now lord we just speak healing in jesus name over every body over every single illness sickness disease or deformity we command healing in jesus name over your body right now in Jesus' name. And we release it over every viewer, no matter where you are. We speak to every organ, function properly in Jesus' name. We speak to the skeletal structure, function the way you were designed to function. From the backs, to the feet, to the legs, every bone structure come into alignment and function properly in Jesus' name. We speak to every organ, every bone structure. I speak to the blood and the blood system. Be cleansed and restored. Work properly in Jesus' name. I speak to every cell of cancer, and I command you to go in Jesus' name. You have no right to be here. Get out in Jesus' name. No sickness in the body of Christ. It is a trespasser. 
And we speak health and wholeness over your body in Jesus' name. Now take a moment and test it out if you can. If you need to move around, bend over, touch your toes, bite your tongue, whatever you need to do, test it out. Take a moment, try it out with your body and see what's going on. Okay, we're checking it out, we're moving, we're shaking. Okay, wave at me if you're seeing something changing right now. You're feeling a difference. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excellent, that's a good start. Okay, we're going to do that again, and I'm going to pass it to Gary to take it from here. Father, I thank you that you've not run out of power. And I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. I thank you, Father, that you've started that healing process in so many people. And I pray that you bring it to completion in Jesus' name. So right now, receive your healing. I want you to focus on not only the condition, but focus on the presence of God. Because you'll begin to see and, and perceive the healing manifested in your body. So receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, let your glory come. Let your power be released. Let it increase now in Jesus' name. Thank you for doing a quick work, a quick work. Pain, go in Jesus' name. Ears be healed. Eyes be healed in Jesus' name. skin conditions, even breathing, abdominal conditions, be healed in Jesus' name. Right now, freedom. Freedom. Freedom from sickness and disease. Freedom from sickness and disease. I command those demons of sickness and disease to leave your body now. And I speak to your body and I say, respond to the presence of God. Respond to the living presence of God and receive that healing now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Okay, quickly, just test your body again. Do, do something that was difficult. Check the pain level. Check your hearing. Check your vision. You know, if you move, move, swing your head around, if it's your neck, bend over if it's your back, you know, if it's your knees, whatever it is, if it's your shoulder, just start swinging your arm. Just do whatever you have to do to see if there's improvement. Okay? Okay, got it? Good. Okay, how many of you, there's a measure of healing. You know that something is going on. Okay, that's good. See, that's more. Now, how many of you, of those that just raised your hand, how many of you feel like you're completely healed, that you've been healed? Just, okay, good. Anybody else? Okay, good, good. Okay. Just to just to what, what ma'am? What what is it? What was the condition? Okay, you can't. Okay, but you'll know when you. Okay, good. You, but you felt the Lord coming over you. Okay, good. And there was somebody else over here. Who was it? Yes. Okay. Did you feel the pain leaving? Yes. Intense pain in his back and felt. Praise God. Okay, that's good. Neck pain for years and it's gone. Praise God. Hold on to that because a lot of you, the, the process has started and you may wake up totally healed tomorrow. Okay? Excellent. Go ahead. Just switch that out to this one. Okay. All right. So, 
the whole point of all of our ministries, each individually and even together, is equipping the saints. It's not about being the seers up front. So that's over now. So, we've done some teaching, we've done a lot of activating, we've opened the opportunity, but now it's really time for you to just take it and run with it. So here's what we're going to do next. This sanctuary is just open and you can feel free to go around as you feel, you know, I need to go over here, I need to go over here. But we're going to take a moment, everybody stand to your feet. We're going to put some worship music on in just a minute. And what we'll do is we've already identified a lot of stuff in this room. And even if it wasn't the stuff you saw, it was something someone else saw, you have an opportunity to engage in it. This is the physical act of obedience done in faith, releasing that spiritual reality. And if you need to come up here and get in the giant glass of, of iced tea, whatever we got going on there, then come up and get in it. And if you need to go up and, and just sit with these on the stage, on the steps, you're welcome to do that. This really is now just you, even though there's you know 150 other people, this is personal between you and the Holy Spirit to take some time to just enjoy all the different atmospheres that are inside this room. Because now that it's been released, that there's an awareness, there's, there's a presence that comes with that. Now, people ask me very flippantly all the time, you know, what are you seeing right now? But I know as soon as I release the word of what I'm seeing, there's a presence that comes with it, and that needs to be hosted and regarded. And so I, I'm careful when I share stuff, because it releases something immediately into the realm that they're just kind of playing around with. And I, I want to be careful with when I say it, it's here now, and we get to enter into it. So with that, it's out here. And even if it wasn't your word, you can jump into someone else's what they saw. So you can lay in the aisles, you can breathe in the smoke, you can come around the room. But we're going to release the, the, the worship music, and we're going to release all of us to just take some time and enjoy the atmosphere of all the different presence that's in this room right now. So please put, put your hands on your eyes one last time here tonight. And Lord, I want to release impartation. And Lord, impartation does not always have to be by the laying on of hands because Lord, you're way more supernatural than that. And so for tonight, I just want to release your people to receive from your presence in all the different atmospheres that are in this room right now, to walk in freedom, and even for those at home right now, I just speak over every home that is watching that there would be an atmosphere of presence of the Holy Spirit that you could enter into in your own house right now and encounter the Lord. And I speak that over every home, no matter where you are, that you would receive that presence and could enter into your own encounter, even at home right now. Nobody should feel bad about not being in this room because you have the Holy Spirit with you right now and you're about to enter into an encounter. And we just bless you, this whole room, we just bless you in Jesus' name. We bless you. And so we release everybody here to enter in to a time of free worship. In Jesus' name, I bless you. Amen. Go ahead and play whatever you have picked out. Move about, go around. I encourage you not to stay in one place, but to find a place and then move and shift. Check out the board if you need to remember what's in the room. And we're just going to let this go for a while. Nothing's gonna hold me back. Nothing's gonna hold me back. Nothing's gonna hold me back.